Hello? Everyone hear me? Good. Excellent. Last year, the BBC made 36.5 billion minutes of content available online. My name's Stephen Godwin. I'm Senior Technical Architect at the BBC. And over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the video the BBC makes available online, where we want to go in the future, and how we've built a scalable transcode system that integrates with our broadcast chain to enable us to, to do that. So a lot of the content the BBC makes available is locked down so it can only be accessed in the UK. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about what video we make available online. Obviously the biggest event for us over the last couple of years has been the Olympics and this has all the really impressive numbers around it. We made 24 live streams available online in HD. We made about two and a half thousand hours of video on demand content available during the two weeks of the Olympics. And during those two weeks, we received 111 million requests for video. On our busiest day, we served out 2.8 petabytes of data. This summer, we had the Glastonbury Music Festival. This takes, over, this takes place in Glastonbury over a couple, of, a couple of days a weekend in the summer. And there are five stages. The BBC had live streams from all five stages. We made 177 hours of content available, made up of more than 160 sets, clips, highlights from more than 120 artists, including the Rolling Stones, Arctic Monkeys, Mumford and Sons. That very same weekend, we also had the Grand Slam Tennis at Wimbledon in the UK. And from that, we made 155 hours of content available online. And we had 10 live streams from all the different courts at Wimbledon. Because we weren't busy enough, uh, busy enough already that weekend, we also had the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. And we had several live streams from that and 20 hours of content in total. However, the vast majority of content we make available online as video is via the BBC iPlayer, which is our catch-up TV service. It's the biggest video on-demand service in the UK and it's free as long as you're in the UK. On average, we receive 7 million requests a day. That's about 2% of the BBC's total output. So although that's single figures, that's still a significant amount of our output. We add 500 unique hours of content every week. And that content is, always, is made available for at least seven days. A lot of it is made available for much longer, up to 45 days, depending on the exact rights we've got. We support over 1,000 devices. That includes IPTVs, smartphones, tablets, games consoles, set-top boxes, um, oh, and, and Macs and PCs. On the PCs, on the tablets, and on the smartphones, we also allow people to download content and keep it on those devices for 30 days. That means you can watch content while you're offline, while you're on a plane, while you're on the underground subway. Um, the apps that allow us to deliver those streams and those downloads to, mo to smartphones and tablets have been very successful, and we've just gone past the 20 million download mark for those apps. So one of the questions we're asking ourselves a lot inside the BBC at the moment is what we want the BBC to look like for our 100th birthday. We've got our 100th birthday coming up in 2022, and so we're looking forward, what shape do we want the BBC to be in, in 2022? 
And the Director General, the head of the BBC, gave a speech about a month ago outlining his vision for that. And this is what he said about the iPlayer. He wants it to be the front door to the BBC. In that same speech, he also talked about what we'd like to do over the next couple of years for the iPlayer. And I've got a short video now which goes into what we want to do with the iPlayer over the next couple of years. I use iPlayer to watch any programmes I've missed or the news or the sports. Used it for catching up with uh, sport on TV. Watch any programme any time we want, so I really like it. Just even things that I might not see on TV. Browse around, which is it's good fun. I think, you know, I can't live without it. Now we're going to reinvent BBC iPlayer for the next decade. What if it could be more than just TV online? What if it gave you an even greater range of brilliant content made exclusively for BBC iPlayer? Yeah, you play a tune for like five minutes, we're like two minutes in. Bang, mix it, mix it. Mix it, yeah. yeah. Even more channels with the content you love all in one place. <laughs> you worry about the future? What will come will come. And personalised for you. Well, we've got all your favourites here. What if BBC iPlayer transformed the way you enjoyed TV so you could dive deeper, control what you see, and get closer to the action? It won't be easy to look at giraffes in the same way again. And offered not just seven days to catch up, but 30. What if you could watch things before they were even on TV and create your own evening schedule. So we could go backwards in time. In space, yes. And forwards in time. Space, totally. So, where do you want to go, hey? And your favourite shows fitted to the time you've got. Starting on one screen and finishing on another. Wherever you are. Making the most of your time with the BBC. BBC iPlayer. We want to make it the best TV service in the world. So it became very obvious that our existing transcode system that was about four or five years old wasn't going to be able to cope with this amount of content with what we wanted to do over the next couple of years. So about a year ago, we started a project to rewrite the workflow around our transcode delivery and ingest. And we called that project Video Factory. It was designed to be scalable from the ground up and to use the cloud. Why did we decide to use the cloud? We wanted something that would, that would scale. And the old system it was placing was obviously, it was four or five years old, it was a hardware-based system. And when we built that, we weren't sporting smartphones, we weren't sporting tablets, we weren't sporting IPTVs, and we had no idea some of these things were coming along. So very rapidly after the system was first put into use, we started running into limits. We'd run into limits of disk space, of disk I.O., of bandwidth. And those are actually quite difficult limits to remove, um, to remove limits around disk space you need to potentially buy new racks, buy new disk arrays. This actually all gets quite expensive. Network I.O. is even worse. You've got to upgrade network gear and ch change network gear across the whole system. So the transcode process itself, the transcode infrastructure, became the bottleneck for what we could make available online. Actually, was, we were making decisions about what we made available online based on our transcode infrastructure, which is the wrong way around. So when we came to design this system, we wanted something that would scale, not just in terms of technology, so we could keep on adding new um, instances of it, um, handle more content, but also something that would scale in terms of price. So if somebody came to me and said, we want to add 10% more content on iPlayer, I could say, you know, this is how much it's going to cost. I could do a detailed breakdown, and it would come out at about 10% more than what we were spending 
already, or hopefully better. A lot of the cloud models, the more, the more you do, the cheaper it gets. We also wanted to improve the reliability of the system. The old system had some single points of failure, and we wanted to move the system onto a broadcast basis, a broadcast quality basis, where we had the same sorts of resilience models that the broadcast chain has. We want to remove all the single points of failure. And we wanted to be able to handle spikes in load. Some of our live content, and I'll go into this in detail a bit later on, is actually quite spiky. We get a lot of live content at certain times, and then none at others. So we want to be able to cope with that. So this, at a very high level, is the architecture for Video Factory. I'm a technical architect. This um, is, is as, as detailed as the diagram's going to be get. You'll be glad to know. Um, I, the, the real one is like, it's a PCB diagram with, won't fit on one slide. But this is, this is the simplified version. And over the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk you through these boxes, what's going on, and just ex explain how the system works. So the first part of the architecture on the left-hand side is how we actually capture the live broadcasts from TV. It's where we integrate with the SDI feeds. So integrating with broadcast feeds is interesting. Um, does anybody know what this building is? It is. It's Alexandra Palace. Fantastic. Um, What's interesting about Alexandra Palace, or this transmitting tower and Alexandra Palace, is this plaque at the bottom. And the words on that plaque are really carefully chosen. Um, it says, the world's first regular high definition television service was inaugurated here by the BBC, 2nd of November, 1936. And like I say, the words on that plaque are very carefully chosen, so it can claim to be the first. And it also occurs to me that high definition meant something different in 1936. <laughs> um, but really what's surprising about, or what always surprises me about that plaque is the date, is the 1936. Broadcast infrastructure, the BBC, has been around for a little while. So as a software engineer, as a technology guy, on working on a product that's only existed since 2007, come along with a little bit of trepidation when I sort of go to the broadcast um, engineers in the BBC and go, can we play with the broadcast chain, please? And can we put some new bits in it? But they've actually been fantastic. And in fact, their attitude could probably have been summed up by what took you so long to get here. Um, we've been expecting you to turn up. So they've been incredibly helpful in terms of telling us the best locations to integrate with their system. And we now appear with the terrestrial broadcast. We've got the same levels of resilience, the same levels of monitoring, the same levels of alerting if our signal goes dead that the broadcast system has. So this is a little bit of a deeper look into that video capture piece. So we've got the SDI feeds on the left-hand side. That's going into a broadcast uh, grade encoder, and that's spitting out RTP packets. And then we've written, effectively, a real-time piece of software, which is capturing those RTP packets and assembling them into 80 megabyte chunks on disk. And those 80 megabyte chunks make up about 20 seconds worth of HD or about 90 seconds worth of SD. And then we've got another program running on the same box, which is taking those chunks off disk and uploading them to Amazon S3. And this is sort of our footprint in the broadcast chain. The rest is done in the, in the cloud. Um, you can see that, that RTP packets coming out of the broadcast encoders. It's a mezzanine quality. We obviously can't throw around the, the SDI um, bit rates in an IP network. So we knock it down to about 
I think it's 10 megabits a second for SD and I think 30 for HD. And that gives us a good enough quality that we can still do the rest of our transcodes off that, but it makes it a bit more manageable as an IP layer. So in terms of resiliency, we're on multiple locations and the box that runs this process, we have multiple, we have two of them at each location. And then, yeah, we have several locations. Every channel is captured at least twice um, and that, that's spread out for our broadcast infrastructure. Next piece in the design is this time addressable media store. So having got the files in these 80 meg chunks up into S3, we then need a way of actually building something useful we can use as a transcode source. So there's a trick we can do with S3. Well, so we, what we do is we take the 80 megabyte files, concatenate them together and make one big source file. And there's a trick you can do with S3, we can actually ask S3 to do this without the files leaving S3. So Amazon just moves some pointers around and we can produce a 10 gigabyte file in about 10 seconds, less than 10 seconds. So our average program takes less than a minute to assemble using this mechanism. And that gives us a system where we can ask it, okay, I want what was on BBC One last night between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. And it'll give me a file back that's guaranteed to contain that. Might actually have a few seconds either end because it's made up of these chunks. So there might be some seconds before and some seconds afterwards. But it's guaranteed to contain that time where we've asked for. So it's the best PVR in the world. Um, so we've also integrated with our, the, the actual playout system itself controls what's currently being played on BBC One or BBC Two and we get an XML feed of data out of that and we can see what's happening we can we can see what's happening we get the start exact start and exact end times frame accurate from that system and because we've put a time code and we've synced it all up in at the beginning of the chain and that's that gets copied through in the, in the mezzanine in the chunks, we can then feed that data into the transcoding process and get exact perfect starts and ends of programs that have been recorded from live automatically. So I'm going to talk about the transcoding system next. That's really the heart of this system. And this is a more detailed view of it. So we've built this transcode abstraction layer, which gives us the ability to work with any different encoding provider. It also has logic in it that understands the different profiles we, we use to make video available on all the different devices. So it knows which profiles, which encodings can be bundled together efficiently. And it will then route them off to an appropriate back end. At the moment, we're mainly using Elemental Cloud. We also use ETS for some audio clip work. And we've built our own subtitle back end for certain circumstances. And we have the ability to add in more. It's a, it's a very, it, we have, it's a very good abstraction layer that enables us to hook new systems in. And we've also, experimented with using this to actually build a hybrid system so that we can then have encoders, hardware encoders, on site that this system calls out to and that's worked perfectly as well. I should briefly mention we've also got file-based ingest here, so very similar to what I've been talking about for live, but with files that we've got pre-delivered we, we typically get programs pre-delivered three days before they actually get broadcast. So it means we can get ahead of the game, have them all sat there ready, and then when the schedule ticks over, they become available on the website. Um, I haven't gone into that into much more detail because it's their files. It's actually a lot more boring than um, 
the, the capturing of the live broadcast. Why are we using a transcoder in the cloud rather than a transcoder on the ground? As I said, we could integrate with a transcoder on the ground. So earlier I mentioned that our live output can be quite spiky. Um, this graph gives an idea of how spiky it can be. So this is a, a week's worth of live transcoding load on our system. And one of the challenges we have is every weekday evening at 6.30, we have a regional news program. Um, BBC One, our main channel, goes from being one channel to being 19. And so suddenly I have 19 half an hour long live news programs to cope with. And, and this is sort of the worst case scenario. It's news, so people actually care about the timeliness of it. Nobody wants old news. It's you know, there's a lot of them. It's live. I can't do anything to help in advance because it's a live program. If I could pre-deliver live content, I'd be a rich man. Um, so it has really caused us problems. And in the past, with our old transcode system, it took us every weekday, it was taking us 10 hours or more to get through this workload. Um, with a cloud-based transcoder, what we can do, it's a very predictable event list. We can spin up extra transcode resource in advance, have it all sat there ready to clear the regional news programs, regional news and sports programs. And we now get through that in about 20 minutes. And that means now that it makes live programs in the evening that come on after this regional news available much quicker as well because they would get queued up behind all these regional news programs so if we had a live program on at seven or eight in the evening it would take potentially a very long time to get on potentially the following day before it was available on the iPlayer uh, we could do clever tricks with rearranging it in the queue but we didn't necessarily want to do that so it's an ideal pattern, an ideal scenario for using a burst capacity that the cloud gives you. <coughs> so the next step is distribution and that's like I say at a high level the architecture. In terms of software we built it as lots of small components, about 20 components in total. Each component just does one thing. And in fact, our developers, our software developers, wrote tests to check the behavior of each component before they wrote the code itself to, for the component. And that meant we had a very clear contract of behavior for each one of these components. Do one thing, do it well. And then we join them all together to build this system. We've used um, message queuing, which is um, a software architecture pattern extensively through, through this system. Amazon have a product called SQS, a simple queuing service, um, which, which, we, which we use. And that's just enabled us to build a system which will scale very easily. Um, it's a bit of a software architecture. Um, pattern that is, that's been established for more than 10 years and it's, it's very well known, very well understood. But it means it, it makes it very easy for us to add extra instances, for them to share the workload between them, so we can increase the instances of these individual components we're running as well, so they don't become bottlenecks in the system. And it also gives us resiliency, it gives us a very good model for coping if a data center goes away, we keep on going. Yes. This software that you're referring to is what? This is your workflow software? Yes. Around your yeah, so this is all the control software around the transcoding and distribution and ingest that drives the iPlayer. So in terms of deploying that software, we had a very fixed end date we were working to. 
Um, the old system was built and, uh, alongside a, a third party. We had a third party involved. The contract with the third party had a very specific end date and they had no interest in keeping that system running. So from the moment we started writing this, we knew we had a, a very particular timeline we needed to meet. We deployed it out in very small stages, so we did the transcode piece first, the transcode abstraction layer I was talking about, and we used that with, we integrated that with our CLIPS infrastructure. And um, we used the term CLIPS inside the BBC slightly oddly. We, CLIP really means anything that isn't broadcast. So the two hour sets I was talking about from Glastonbury are notionally CLIPS in this system. And in fact, that was our, our first big test case of deploying this system was for Glastonbury for that 170 odd hours of content that we made available and it handled that very well. We then built the mezzanine capture system and deployed that and that gave us our safety net um, in terms of once that was in place we knew we could somehow or other always capture anything that was broadcast and it might be a bit slower than we'd like but we would always be able to get it and that's that was really the point at which we knew the system would work because that gave us a backstop it meant there would be continue to be video in iPlayer once we'd built that which was a relief and then we optimized on that so we built the file based delivery workflow which meant that for the content we get in advance we can process it in advance and have it sat there ready for the clock to tick over. We used a continuous delivery method, um, again another piece of software engineering um, approach, which meant we were actually trying to keep the amount of code that we'd written that wasn't deployed to live at any one time down to the minimum. So we were constantly pushing changes out to live and that worked very well with this deployment in several steps. To do that, you need to be very confident that you have a way of reversing the change if it goes wrong. And you also need to have really good monitoring so you know it's gone wrong. So the systems were built with monitoring in from day one. We designed monitoring into the systems. And that gives us a a really good overview, we can look at any piece of content and see its lifespan through our system, where it's been, what it's done, um, what caused us to generate that piece of content. And that reduced, it was a bit scary to begin with, but we got used to redeploying regularly and reconfiguring the live system regularly. And once we got on top of it, actually, you're delivering only 20 changes at once. It's a much smaller, much more comfortable set of things to be de being deliver to deliver and reduces the risk of something going wrong. So what's this system enabled us to do? More content. Um, we're now not the blocker. We can put more content through the system. It's also meant, as I mentioned with the regional news programs, faster delivery of live programs but not just those live programs, there are other places in the broadcast schedule where we get multiple live events happening at the same time and we need to peak, but we need to scale up to handle, with that, handle that load. And it's also enabled us to do something we call iPlayer premieres. So these are programs we make available on the BBC iPlayer seven days before they're broadcast traditionally. We did this first with a comedy program on BBC Three called Bad Education. BBC Three is our channel targeting 15 to 25 year olds, so it's a good demographic for online video. And we were quite startled at how successful it was. Um, we were expecting it to be reasonably successful. Um, I should tell you a little bit more about BBC Three. For a program on BBC Three, one and a half million viewers it's, it's, it's doing fairly well. Um, we'd be happy with that. Um, this content we made available 
as a premiere, we got one and a half million requests for the video before it was broadcast. So just from the online version. And then, in, I don't know the exact figures for broadcast, but we got a normal broadcast audience, probably dented a little bit by that, and obviously more views online after it was broadcast, as we make it available. We did that for every episode in that series, and some of the later episodes, we actually got two million requests for the video. We've started doing this with more comedies and programs on BBC Three, and I can see more demand for doing that in the future. We also make iPlayer exclusive, so content that's only available on the BBC iPlayer. Um, the content from Glastonbury I was talking about earlier is a really good example. Um, over that one weekend, we had so much content, we couldn't have broadcast it all on our conventional channels. So the BBC iPlayer becomes the place where we can make that content available. What do we expect to be doing in the future? More content. People always want more. The only thing I've had, the only constant in this job since I started it has been that people have wanted more and more content to be put through the system. They want higher bit rates. We've got more of our channels going HD and that will generate, obviously, higher bit rates, and most programs come in HD now as well, if we get them pre-delivered. And there's going to be more devices. There are always more devices, and that probably will mean more transcodes and different profiles. High, you can imagine higher bit rates on tablets is something that's going to happen fairly soon. We'd also like to integrate this with our simulcast chain, so we have and uh, quite an old system now, which makes BBC One, BBC Two, our conventional channels, three and four, um, available online um, as a simulcast online and, and tradi a traditional broadcast. Um, that system, like I say, is quite old. It can't do HD. We'd really like to integrate it into this system and actually using some of the tricks we learnt from the Olympics, we can actually use that integration of the simulcast chain into Video Factory to enable much quicker delivery of live programmes on some devices and getting it down to like two minutes um, after the live programme ends. So um, that would be, yeah, that, that's fantastic and that's something we're, we're looking actively at at the moment. So in summary, I've talked to you a little bit about the video content that BBC makes available online, what we want to do with BBC iPlayer in the future, and how we've built this cloud-based system to enable that, and how it's allowed the technology just to get out of the way, um, and us actually focus on what content we make, want to make available. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? So I can't say how much it costs, but I can certainly talk about the time and I can talk about the number of developers. Um, so we started looking at this about 18 months ago in terms of overall architecture. We built a couple of prototypes with just one or two people working on them, trying out the technologies, seeing what would work and what wouldn't work. Um, obviously, we talked to a lot of third parties at that point. Um, we started in earnest developing the software about a year ago, just a little bit over a year ago, and the system went, well, we turned the old system off beginning of September, so, and we'd been live for a couple of months before then, depending on, live with the full system for a couple of months before then, live with parts of it as early as Glastonbury, which is during the summer. How many people were part of the project? Um, so it's 18 developers. Um, one eight, yeah, um, um, over that year. And 
that's, that's an approximation because obviously it's not a completely constant number of developers over a year. But yeah, um, if you take an average, it's 18 developers. The, the 18 developers are for the iPlayer or for the video factory? Uh, for video factory. Yes. As part of your um, development, the components, are you, uh, did you develop your own CMS as well, or are you using SMS? Okay, so I'm, I should be repeating the questions, and sorry, I didn't repeat the first question, which was about what were the economics of um, building the system. Um, in terms of did we build our own CMS, or did we use a third-party one, um, we have an in-house CMS. Um, that actually hasn't really changed very much for this project, we've just, we've integrated with the existing one. Um, yeah, we have, we have an internal system um, for clip publishing, which integrates with our CMS system as well. But the CMS system itself is used for much more than that. We have um, parts of the BBC ded website dedicated to programs and lots of content, some of it text, some of it video, some of it audio. Um, yeah. Uh, that's not, that's, that's hosted um, on our traditional infrastructure at the moment. What's the uh, software development stack? Um, so, so what's software development stack? Um, it's mainly Java, um, Tomcat, quite um, a little bit of Spring, um, Apache Camel we use a lot and we've actually contributed back to Apache Camel um, for the SQS integration. Um, <coughs> we've also developed some of our own standards or what standard ways of working with um, putting logging into the system um, and eventing in infrastructure into the system to make it very easy to monitor the system. Um, and we send that data to Splunk. We use Splunk as a to visualize that data. In terms of video players, do you build your own? Do you use uh, the shell? We build our own. Um, and because uh, we, often we need features which aren't in the native players, although we integrate with native players in some cases. We need closed captions, subtitles. Um, we, th we think that's very important. We try to support that wherever we can. And that has meant writing our own players on some devices. Um, on things like IPTVs, as much as possible, we try and use a HTML5 um, interface. Um, sometimes that's wrapped in another layer. Um, but that gives us the, we, we're not keen to rewrite our client lots and lots of times on lots of different devices. So we try to go about it in a way that gets us lots of devices with one client, but we, we care a lot about quality as well. So um, sometimes that means writing your own player. Hey, sorry. What is uh, BBC's retention policy for video on demand? How do you keep those videos available? Um, so video on demand at the moment is made available for seven days um, after broadcast, but for some programs we have I should have repeated the question again. Sorry, bad at this. Um, so the question was about what's the retention policy for our video, our video on demand content. Um, we keep, mo everything is kept available for seven, at least seven days. There's actually one or two exceptions to that around news where it doesn't really make sense to keep it for as much as seven days, but everything else is at least seven days. Um, for some programs, for a lot of programs actually now, we have a thing we call series stacking internally, which means we keep episodes of a series available until seven days after the last episode is broadcast. So that's, that's how we get up to the 45 day figure for some, for some content. Um, you can see from the, the video I played, we'd like to increase that to 30 days um, over the next couple of years. Uh, we use multiple CDNs. Um, we, we have a relatively large infrastructure of our own as well. Um, 
um, but uh, which we upgraded for the Olympics, and you can, we're actually quite glad we upgraded for the Olympics because you, he you heard the figures. Um, but yeah, we work with uh, a cross section of CDNs. Plan to take any of the terrestrial channels solely online in the future. Um, not that I know of. It's not really so much a technical question as a business question, and I'm a technical guy. Um, you can certainly see, again, from that video I played, there was talk about having pop-up channels, effectively, around particular subjects. It'd be very good to have, effectively, guest curators of content. So you could get somebody like Professor Brian Cox to um, curate a science channel. Um, and, and, and solely have that online. Yes, absolutely. And that's something that's been talked about. Um, <laughs> uh, so you talked about cloud in terms of your uh, transporting strategy. Does cloud play a part in your distribution strategy as well? I mean, once the content is transported, mm -hmm. are you on the cloud? Do you bring it back in house? So at the moment, we bring, I should repeat the question. Um, question, I think, can be summarized as are we looking at using the cloud or do we use the cloud? for our distribution strategy as well as for our transcoding. At the moment, we bring it back in-house into our traditional distribution infrastructure, but we've very, very seriously been looking at what we can do with the cloud to use, the, to do a, a, use cloud as origin. Obviously, it makes a lot of sense if the data is already up there, not to have to bring it back to site to distribute it. Um, and that also helps remove other potential bottlenecks in the system. We're not having, you know, again, an origin system is also a hardware system. If you're building it yourself, has physical limitations. We make a lot of content available. We can push our origin system quite hard on occasion. Sorry, you, you had a question. Um, is, is your content all protected? So, we protect all our content. I mean, as I mentioned, we have to make available it available only in the UK, so there's that, that's, there's that first level. We also do several other tricks and pieces to protect the content as much as possible. Um, we do use DRM in some places. A very good example of where we use DRM is for the downloads, uh, where it's, um, which you obviously couldn't make a download available for, th to, for somebody to store on their device for 30 days without having some form of DRM to protect it when it's on that device. Any more questions? Sorry, yes? Do you use the uh, uh, video factory workflow for advertisements as well? Um, the BBC doesn't carry, sorry, the question is, do we, do we use the uh, video factory workflow for ads? Um, BBC Public Service in the UK doesn't carry advertisement, so um, we're funded very differently. Any questions? Question at the back. Yes. Um, so the question was, do we apply security inside the video factory workflow? Yes. Um, we've, we've thought quite long and hard about security. You can imagine one of people's first worries when they look at using the cloud is how are we going to keep this stuff secure? So we've had lots of conversations about that. Um, yes. I'm not going to go, if you don't mind, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, publicly about how we're securing things, but yes, we've definitely had a lot of thought about how we keep the system secure. Any more questions? Oh, okay, of course. So the question was, what's our availability been like using the cloud? Um, and by availability, I think you're probably talking about if a system falls over, do we recover? Has that taken things out? Um, I probably couldn't give you, an, we probably haven't been running long enough. Like I say, we've been running since the summer in part and since September in total um, for, um, for a sort of a several nines figure because I don't think the stats would work out and we, ha we haven't run those stats yet. Um, We've had no significant outage. Um, I don't think we've had an outage. It's only couched in those words because I'm trying to think if there's anything I've missed. Um, 
but we've certainly lost no data. Um, the system built to be resilient against both software failure and data center failure. Um, we've taken a very sort of trans traditional transactional message oriented model to the design of the system and yeah, it, it doesn't drop things on the floor. Um, we're very happy with that. Um, the other thing it gives us the ability to do is actually run a pilot light service in another region of Amazon so that if, we, if there was a natural disaster, um, we could move to a different region. And actually that's another thing it's good with, um, it's something we can also take advantage of in the elemental cloud offering because they're in multiple regions as well. Okay, any more questions? I should let people go and have lunch. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>